It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thank you, kindly speaker. Uh, my first question is to the Premier. Today, students, teachers and families across the province are taking to the streets to protest the Premier's attacks on education and his cuts to the classroom. Uh, the Premier successfully created a crisis in education with these reckless cuts, and now he sits silently while schools across Ontario are closed. Will the Premier break his silence today and tell parents and students what he is prepared to do to end the strike? The question is addressed to the Premier Minister of Education. and referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud to confirm and announce in this legislature that our government and the Trustees Association reach another agreement with the Education Workers Alliance of Ontario, which provides predictability, which provides predictability to every parent in this province, which they deserve. We worked hard. We were constructive. We made students the centre of our focus, and we got a voluntary settlement, which is good for all the parties. Speaker, how we got there is by remaining focused on students, on ourselves, by remaining mission critical, and by negotiating in good faith. We hope to do that in, with OSSTF over the coming days. We've offered dates through the media. We hope they'll accept them. We also hope they will accept private mediation without precondition, because our students should not be in the middle of this debate. Speaker. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, across Ontario, parents and students are seeing the damage of the four government cuts. Here in Toronto, the government's heartless cuts have slashed $106 million in operating funding from the Toronto District School Board, directly caused the cancellation of over 300 classes this year, and could lead to the eventual loss of over 1,100 teachers. The Education Minister wants people to be reasonable. The Premier promised that not a single teacher would lose their job. Does he think it was reasonable to turn around and fire 10,000 teachers? Question from referred to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, it is unreasonable for OSSTF to say to parents that they will continue striking unless they get an additional $750 million of tax dollars in this province. Mr. Speaker, just to contextualize what our government could do, what the people of this province could do with $750 million, we could help hire 7,500 mental health workers. We could help build 64 new elementary schools or 28 new secondary schools in this province. Speaker, the priority of this government is to invest in our students. And while the teachers' union and OSSTF specifically has a $1.5 billion dollar demand Order. to the government that if we don't meet that increase in compensation for workers who we value, the second highest paid in the nation, $92,000 on, on average paid in this province, that they're going to continue to strike. I think that's unacceptable. We're going to remain focused on investing in our kids. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, how about protecting our public education system and not going so low as to put one segment of Ontario against another in their drive to cut public services, Speaker? Right. That is disgraceful. In Brant Hall, the Norfolk, folk, conservative cuts could mean at least 56 fewer teachers in the classroom. Over 40 classes have already been cut this year alone. And that doesn't sound reasonable, Speaker, to the kids who've been kicked out of their classrooms. And it sure isn't reasonable to the teachers that have been kicked to the curb. Why does the Premier think it's reasonable to force students to accept these cuts? And why does he think it's reasonable for his Minister of Education to pit one Ontarian against another in their cruel race to the bottom? Members, please take their seats. Minister to reply. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the focus of this government is to keep kids in class. We just negotiated another agreement with the EWAO, which demonstrates that we can get deals with Labour in this province, and we're really proud of the work that they did as well to get it done. Mr. Speaker, in the context of our teachers, I want to be clear. These are our friends and family and our caucus members. We value their contribution. I'm prepared, and I believe we should be paying and spending significant amounts in the context of ensuring we get good we get good teachers in the front of class. However, Mr. Speaker, what is unfair to the taxpayer is for them to say that they will continue to escalate, continue to strike, and keep kids out of class if they do not get an additional $750 million. Since 2003-04, Mr. Speaker, we have 12 percent more teachers. Since that period, we have less than 1 percent more students. Speaker, just to contextualize, since in 2018-19, the number of teachers in the system increased by 2,140, a 1.6 percent increase, the largest year-over-year -year increase in the number of teachers in over a decade. We're going to continue to invest in our educators, but most importantly, in our students. 
The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier, uh, but before I deliver it, I do want to also personally, uh, and on behalf of my caucus as the Leader of the Official Opposition, uh, thank uh, Susan Swift for her, her excellent tenure here at the Legislature. All the great work. Speaker, no one believes that the Ford government. Uh, no one believes the Ford government when they say that they're standing up for education. Parents told this government during the consultation that they didn't want these cuts. Teachers told them at the bargaining table that the cuts would hurt our kids. Students marched out in the thousands to tell them that they didn't want these cuts. The premier owes them an answer today, Speaker. Why did he ignore them all? To the Minister of Education and referred to the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. We are listening to all parents of this province, which is why, under the Premier's leadership, this government is investing over $1.2 billion more on track and spending $1.2 billion more this year than last year alone in the defence of public education in this province for students in English and French, Catholic and public, North and South, East and West, in every region that we're seeing more investment in the front of class. The contrast, Mr. Speaker, is that there are those in this House and certainly those Order. at the table who insist on increasing increasing spending for compensation, for pay and benefits, whereas the priority of this government is to be fair, is to increase the Order. increased compensation by $750 million. It is reasonable. However, some would prefer us to double that number. And my point, Speaker, is it is fair for taxpayers to offer $750 million, but it's also important and fair to the future of this country that we invest in our students in mental health, in math supports, in STEM, and giving them Response. every tool to achieve their potential in this province. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I'd, I'd like to go back to the Premier and hopefully I'll get a response because his government's education cuts are hitting communities across Ontario. Families from Hastings and Prince Edward District School Board are fighting back against Conservative cuts that could lead to at least 73 fewer teachers in their classrooms. In Grand Erie, cons Conservative cuts have led to the loss of 98 classes this year, a number that could grow to over 900 fewer classes in a few years' time. How can this Premier and this government look these families in the eye when they go home over the holidays and tell them that this attack on their children's future is reasonable? Minister. Mr. Speaker, this government, this progressive Conservative government, is investing more in public education than any government in the history of this province. We are, we are investing, Speaker. An additional $1.2 billion in the public accounts this year than last year. Mr. Speaker, we are investing $24 billion to school boards across our province. We have doubled the mental health funding. We are spending over $3 billion in special ed because we value the dignity of every child, including those with exceptionalities in school. We're providing more supports for math, a $200 million four-year math strategy to lift math scores after 10 years of consecutive declines under the former Liberal government. The contrast could not be more clear. The priority of our members is to invest in students, not in compensation. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the problem is virtually nobody involved in the education system, from the students to the parents to the educators and educational workers, believe a single word that this minister is saying, nor do they agree with his characterization of what this government is doing to our education system. The government has been clear. It's not about kids in the classroom. If it was, the Premier wouldn't be kicking them out of the classroom and forcing them into the online learning courses that will not work for many of them. This government has been laser focused on one thing, Speaker, and that is making classroom cuts and blaming anybody but themselves for the fallout. Teachers, students, parents have all been clear. Cancel the cuts. Cancel the cuts. Stop hurting everyday families and let teachers and students get back to work in the classroom. Will the Premier of this province do that? Members, please take their seats. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My message to OSSTF is to cancel the strike that is needlessly hurting students in the class of this province. Mr. Speaker, this government is investing more in public education than any government in our history. And Speaker, just yesterday, I was proud to announce as a proof point that we are working in good faith to get deals, to keep kids in class, that the Education Workers Alliance of Ontario, we got another deal with them following the deal with CUPE. This is progress for families. Families should not be in the middle of this debate. I appreciate there are you know, uh, principled positions on all sides, but the kids shouldn't pay the price for the difference at the table. A $750 million demand in compensation 
is unreasonable, it is unfair, and we will fight hard every day to invest more in children, not in compensation. The next question, the member from Mishkigawak, James Bay. Merci, Monsieur le Président, bonjour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The number of students re registered in Francophone schools is on the rise, but as a result of a shortage of teachers, we know that there will be fewer adults available to help our students. We're, we're already short on teachers. We're short on supply teachers and educators. And your government wants to eliminate hundreds of positions in schools. And we also know that this shortage will have a butterfly effect throughout the Francophone education systems. Francophones have already been the subject of various attacks by your government. So why do, are you continuing your attacks on education? Questions addressed to the Premier. Education. And referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Mrs. Mr. Speaker, I want to be clear. Our government is investing more in French language education than any government in history. An additional 16 an additional $16 million as reported in the budget and the public accounts. It is a commitment we have to linguistic duality in this province. We are proud, and I am proud, to work in partnership with the Minister of Francophone Affairs as we work to ensure that French language educators are able to be retained in this province. We're working with our stakeholders within the sector to ensure we have access to high talented French language educators. Nous allons continuer notre travail. We'll continue our work with our Francophone partners in Ontario. Students, we have a plan to help ensure we have French language educators in the front of class, and I'm going to continue to work by investing more in French language than any government in the history of this province. A supplementary question. It's not by cutting in the system that with less and less teachers that you will have schools that will grow. Still to the Premier. The Minister of Education said yesterday that your government is reasonable during negotiations. However, a few days ago, we learned that parents rejected fully the number of students in classrooms. The minister didn't listen to the parents nor the students and not the teachers either. Mr. Speaker, the, if the minister is so reasonable, why thousands of parents and teachers are outside of classes of defending public education in Ontario? Mr. Speaker, the fact is this government is investing more in French language education. To the point on the French language shortage of teachers, we appreciate that full well, an issue, a phenomenon that has existed before our government. But we're working with the Ontario College of Teachers, we're working with faculties of education, and I'm working with the Minister of Colleges and Universities to incent more uh, rather future teachers entering the trades, entering the sector, and ultimately working in the front of class. Speaker, in the context of our investments in education, we are investing an additional in the economic statement, $200 million more million in public education to support French language and English language education in every region of our province. Speaker, we're going to continue to stay focused on our students, investing more in their futures, and we're going to fight hard at the table to keep them in class. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, we know that Ontario's strong relationship with our neighbour to the south cannot be understated. If Ontario were a country, we would be the U.S.'s third largest trading partner. Two-way trade between Ontario and U.S. amounted to $301 U.S. dollars last year. $301 billion U.S. dollars last year. We are the number one customer to 19 U.S. states and second to nine others. Under your leadership, our province is turning around economically. Our government has a plan that is working. We are showing the world that Ontario is open for business once again. Premier, can you tell the legislature more about the important economic role Ontario has for North America Question. and your recent visit to Maryland? The Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Scarborough Rouge Park. He does an incredible job. I saw that he was, uh, he was over at the annual uh, Christmas Carol uh, sing over at St. Dunstone and uh, Canterbury Church recently, so I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas over there. Over, Mr. Speaker, over the last 16 uh, months, I've, I've talked to over 26 governors in person, uh, meeting all the governors, building a relationship, 
And I can, I can tell you, the message is very clear that Ontario is open for business, open for jobs, and we're the envy of North America. When I sit down with these governors, we're leading the economic growth and jobs anywhere in North America. Before we got elected, Mr. Speaker, we lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs because of the NDP and the Liberals. Now, Response. since we've been elected, there's 271,400 more people working. 271,000 families that can pay their bills. The supplementary question. Thank you, Premier, for that answer and for your continued strong leadership on this front. In light of all the great news and statistics associated with our close economic partnership with the U.S., the Buy American provision are still of great concern. I know our government has made it a priority in close partnership with the federal government to advocate for an exemption for Ontario businesses and workers on this front. As the Prime Minister noted during your recent meeting, Ontario continues to play an important role in promoting Canada's trade interests and strengthening the historic ties with U.S. partners for the benefit of the people of our province and all Canadians. Premier, can you speak further about the strengthening partnerships with our province and our U.S. counterparts under your leadership? Premier. I want to, I want to thank the MVP for that, that question, Mr. Speaker. I had an opportunity to go to uh, Maryland and Washington last uh, week. had an opportunity to sit down with a chair of the Governor's Association, uh, Governor Hogan, and he's an absolute uh, champion. They call him Likeable Larry. I know the reason why they call him Likeable Larry now. For the first time, Mr. Speaker, for the very first time, the governors of the United States of America are coming to Ontario. Why are they coming to Ontario? Because, as, as my member mentioned, we're the number one trading partner to 19 states, yep. number two to nine other states. We do $391 billion a year in two-way trade. We're responsible, both countries, for millions and millions of jobs on both sides of the border. We have a strong relationship, the largest unprotected border in the world. We have to make Lots. sure that we nurture these relationships and continue growing on our relationship, and that's why I look forward to having the governors up here in February. Here, here. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. Through you to the Premier. Speaker, throughout the week, the Premier has refused to answer my questions about lucrative agent general patronage posts that he single-handedly created in Dallas and Chicago. Speaker, yesterday we learned that the two remaining appointees to Dallas and Chicago haven't even set up their offices after six months on the job. Speaker, ever since the Premier created these patronage posts, there have been questions about how much Ontario families are paying to give the Premier's friends these lucrative jobs and whether they'll actually do any work. Speaker, the key question is, why is the Premier refusing to talk about his buddies that he supposedly sent to Dallas and Chicago? The question is addressed to the Premier. Economic development. And referred to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Thank Trade. Thank you very much. As we've, uh, as Speaker, we talked about our agents general in Dallas and Chicago. They've been working through a very thorough and mandatory security process because their offices are located with the federal government in the consul's general office. This is exactly the process that has been required of all agents general throughout the world. Speaker, these the agents general. They are bringing a message all across the United States that Ontario is open for business, open for trade, that we've taken $5 billion out of the cost of doing business in Ontario. This is the message they're delivering, that we've reduced WSIB premiums by more than $2 billion, that we did not go ahead with the Liberal tax of $308 million. Those things that we've done to reduce the cost of doing business Spons. by $5 billion have created 271,600 yes. jobs in the province of Ontario. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker. Conspicuous in his silence, Speaker, the Premier clearly would rather not talk about the yeah, jobs that he's handing to friends, insiders, and relatives. In fact, when we checked the June 20th government announcement of their appointments, we learned that the Premier had retroactively edited the news releases to remove all references to the relatives of the lacrosse playing friends of Dean French who were so unqualified. Speaker, the Premier had to turf them only days after their appointment. Speaker, the question is, why did he have his office quietly change the original news releases? Minister of Economic Development. 
John Tracy Trade. Thank you very much. You know, our agents general are very hard at work, Speaker, both in market and still here in Ontario while they work through this necessary and very thorough process. They'll be permanently in market in the very near future, at which time they're going to continue with the message of being open for business and open for jobs and indeed open for trade. A couple of new things happened yesterday in bills that got passed that give them even more tools that they can talk about. For instance, uh, businesses locating in Northern Ontario no longer pay the aviation fuel uh, tax of 6.7 cents. It's been reduced to 2.7 cents, particularly helping our Northern and First Nations communities. The small business tax credit is reduced by 8.7 percent. By the way, Speaker, these are all things that the NDP voted against, you know, but that should come as a no surprise. Speaker. Sure. They voted against a $90 million uh, payment for uh, providing Response. free dental service to our low-income seniors. Who does that, Speaker? The next question. The member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, to the Minister of Energy. During the 2018 Order. election campaign, the Progressive Conservatives and I campaigned on a promise to reduce electricity by 12%. In November, the Ontario Energy Board approved a time-of-use increase for Hydro One. This increase conflicts and contradicts with the mandate given to this government by the people of Ontario. Once again, my office is being contacted by residents and small businesses that are concerned and worried that this increase will affect their standard of living and their bottom line. Speaker, to the minister, as the largest shareholder of Hydro One Networks, why are you allowing Hydro One to act in a manner that both frustrates and obstructs your mandate and makes a mockery of your commitment? The Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And there is no question that we inherited a mess. And the steps that we've taken over the past year and a half, Mr. Speaker, are a testament to our resolve to reduce costs uh, system-wide, to work more effectively, renew the corporate culture of uh, public utilities, publicly traded utilities that Ontario ratepayers and Ontario taxpayers have a significant investment in. Moving forward, Mr. Speaker, we have the kinds of partnerships with Hydro One, OPG and our local distribution companies that is focused on reducing costs in the system, Mr. Speaker, so that we can provide relief for ratepayers after more than a decade and a half of building up one of the most complex and expensive systems known the continent over. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Again to the Minister of Energy. The government also made a commitment to improve and expand broadband rural internet services. We, and we all know that the greatest obstacles to this expansion is the uncertain, convoluted, costly and lengthy approval process of attaching fiber optic cables to Hydro One's poles. In September, I met with Hydro One executives and provided options for this process and received a commitment to reform their approval process and actually become partners in facilitating rural broadband expansion but Hydro One's commitments appear to be empty as well. For more than a year, the Hydro One and OEB have been frustrating and, and obstructing the government's mandate. Speaker, my question to the minister, when will the minister direct <laughs> Hydro One to cut their red tape and to facilitate broadband expansion in rural Ontario? Minister of Energy. That long ago, Mr. Speaker, that that member was uh, voting for all of the important steps that we've taken. On this particular matter, discussions have taken place with Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. We're making historic investments in broadband here in this province, across rural and northern uh, Ontario, Mr. Speaker, in particular, so that people can have the kind of service that they should expect and other people in other parts of the province uh, do. In, the, uh, in, in moving forward, Mr. Speaker, I can assure the member opposite that those uh, decisions of the past. The Ontario Energy Board, Mr. Speaker, uh, is going to be renewed. Our governance restructured, Mr. Speaker, so these kinds of decisions that are affecting our ability to move broadband forward, Mr. Speaker, will be removed. Thank you. Thank you very much. The member for York Centre. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. I want to begin by thanking the Babcock family 
for being here today. I'd like to express our government's deepest sympathies and condolences for your loss. We recognize that what was already a very difficult time in your lives was made more difficult by a lengthy and exhausting legal process. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House about the Babcock family's courage in raising their issue with our government? Recognize the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from York Centre for this very sensitive and, and important question. And I'd also like to express my heartfelt appreciation to the Babcock family for their advocacy in particular on this very sensitive and important issue. When a family is grieving, Speaker, there should never be a situation when government bureaucracy stands in the way. In most cases, a re to register a death, a certificate is completed by a physician, nurse practitioner, or coroner. Sadly, in Laura's case, this was not possible. The Babcock family bravely and selflessly raised this issue with her government. And that's why my ministry, the Attorney General, and the Premier explore changes to make death registration less burdensome to the victim's family in cases like the Babcocks. We have, we have a duty, all of us in this House, to hear the concerns of Ontarians and get things right. I am pleased to say that the Premier and the MPP from Etobicoke Centre visited with Laurie's family, Laura's family last month and delivered Laura's death certificate. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The situation that the Babcock family went through is heartbreaking, and the legal process made it that much more difficult. Can the minister tell us about the steps our government took to ensure that no other family will have to endure a lengthy legal process so that they're able to put paperwork behind and focus on family? Minister to reply. Speaker to the Attorney General. To the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I too want to extend my deepest gratitude to the Bob, Babcock family for raising this issue with our government, for being here with us today. Earlier this week, we announced changes to the Vital Statistics Act that would amend the death registration process to ease the burden for families faced with registering the death of a loved one in the absence of their remains. Laura's Law, as we have named it, in honour of Laura Babcock, would provide a simpler method for families to obtain a death certificate in these tragic circumstances. This change will provide tools to the courts to facilitate the registration of death in these cases and ensure the families have the necessary support. Laura's Law will ensure that in the future, the death registration process is less burdensome for families who experience a similar unthinkable tragedy. And I'd like to thank the member from Etobicoke Centre for her assistance and the Premier, of course, and my colleague, the Minister of Government Consumer Services. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Kiwetnam. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. <laughs> On November 27th, Carrie Lynn Bunting died by suicide in the community of Constance Lake First Nation. She was 13 years old. On November 28th, Rydell Mickinac died by suicide in the community of Webequa First Nation. He was 12 years old. Premier, these young people died, and uh, why? Because they lost hope. They lost hope in us, responding to the needs of their communities. I speak about lack of clean drinking water, safe, lack of safe housing in our communities, infrastructure and safe schools. Premier, I ask you, what are you prepared to do to give hope to these young people. Questions to the Premier. The Minister of Indigenous Affairs. The Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Honourable Member uh, for his question with respect to the passing, unfortunate passing of these two uh, young people. Uh, the Indigenous uh, Healing and Wellness Strategy Unit uh, has advanced a significant resource uh, for uh, NAN to in improve their capacity to respond. To these, uh, to these particular situations, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to mo mobilize resources and support uh, Anishinaabe Aski Nation in their requests to help in these particular uh, matters, Mr. Speaker. And while our, our thoughts and prayers are with this community, I can assure the honourable member that moving forward, we will continue, redouble our efforts to ensure 
that young people in these Indigenous communities have hope, Mr. Speaker, have the, an opportunity to think about economic prosperity for corridors, Mr. Speaker, that will open their communities to new jobs and the Response. economic, social and health benefits that come with these kinds of significant investments in their communities and to their communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, uh, we need more than thoughts and prayers yes. from this place. Exactly. The issue of youth suicide in our communities is a long-term problem. Colonization is, uh, and its ongoing effects contribute to, contribute to the, uh, the crisis of youth suicide. The continued uh, neglect by colonial governments, like such, such as this place, means young people fall through the cracks, like Rydell, Carrie, Carrie Lynn, and Devon Freeman, who died by suicide while in the child welfare system, but was not found for seven months. This, the crisis of First Nations youth suicide and the approaches used to address, uh, address it are not sufficient and do not reflect the unique needs. Premier, there needs to be dedicated resources and a specialized strategy to address suicide among First Nations youth. Question. Will Ontario make this commitment today? Thank you. And please take their seats. Minister to reply. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. I want to uh, assure him that uh, much of that work is underway. We have benchmarks for uh, success, Mr. Speaker, in terms of uh, reducing uh, the frequency um, uh, in communities by having hub uh, services, wraparound services for teens in crisis in the school. Uh, a facility in their uh, in their community. For example, I'm thinking about Pekanjika, Mr. Speaker, where we've made significant progress coordinating across different ministries to ensure, uh, Mr. Speaker, that we are present in those communities, offering services and programs that can help to prevent, uh, Mr. Speaker, and treat uh, uh, teenagers who, uh, in particular, uh, who are experiencing some form of crisis. But moving forward, Mr. Speaker, we need to talk more seriously about the economic opportunities of these communities, opening up these communities so that people have a, a chance, Mr. Speaker, for a good job, Mr. Response. Speaker, and the hope of the kind of economic prosperity that most communities in other parts of the province uh, have a good shot at. Thanks, Thank Mr. you very Speaker. much. Thank you. Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Minister, earlier this week, you rose in the House to talk about Ontario's growth in job numbers in the month of November. In fact, since June of 2018, 271,600 new jobs have been created in the province of Ontario, due in part to the swift action our government has taken to restore Ontario's competitiveness, ensure that this province is open for business and open for jobs. We know, Mr. Speaker, that in a highly competitive global environment, unlocking the economic potential of trade will be critical to Ontario's success. Growing trade and foreign direct investment will help create jobs and economic prosperity for all Ontarians. Can the minister provide the House with an update on what actions our government is taking to restore Ontario's competitiveness and reduce the cost of doing business in this great province? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and to the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South. You know, our government is absolutely committed uh, to creating and protecting good jobs for the people of Ontario. As I said earlier, Speaker, we have taken five billion dollars out of the cost of doing business. You know, we were told a couple of years ago that uh, the former government made Ontario the most expensive jurisdiction in all of North America in which to do business. The Premier has made a commitment right away to reduce the cost of doing business. We reduced the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board premiums first by 30 percent, Speaker, last year, 17 percent by uh, this year. That's $2.2 billion that will be reduced. We uh, have introduced the corporate income tax cut of $3.8 billion through the Ontario Job Creation Investment Incentive. 
Speaker, we did not proceed with the previous government's uh, tax of $308 million, and we're going to be reducing the cost of red tape by $400 million. Speaker, that's how you create 271,600 jobs. The supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. It's great to hear that our plan to restore Ontario's competitiveness is working and job creators are once again looking to Ontario to invest and grow their business. My question is back to the Minister. Regional economic development is important in growing local economies and strengthening the small business community. It's critical to rural communities like mine that were ignored by the previous government. As a member in a northern riding, I'm sure you no doubt have heard the same from concerns from constituents of yours. Minister, could you please explain how our government is taking action to support regional economic development in the north and in other rural communities like mine? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Speaker, we know that in rural and northern Ontario there are unique challenges, and that's why we've come up with unique solutions as well. The small business tax credit will reduce the cost of doing business in Ontario. That's a reduction of 8.7%. Speaker, the Northern Ontario Aviation Tax Credit. This reduces the cost of aviation fuel in the north from 6.7 cents to 2.7 cents. Those are big numbers, Speaker, when you add them all up. When I think of the red tape reductions, I think of Debbie, who cuts my hair every second Friday back in North Bay, and there's red tape reductions for Debbie's shop. When I think of, the, uh, when I think of our red tape reduction bill, I think of Kayvon Rouhani, who owns Happy Jacks Dry Cleaners. There's provisions in this to help Happy Jacks reduce his costs. Speaker, there's reductions in red tape costs for truckers, mining and forestry companies. All, by the way, which, of which the Spots. NDP voted against. They voted against the small business tax credit. They voted against the Northern Ontario Aviation Fuel Tax Credit. They voted against all of those savings for our small businesses. Thank you. Next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd also like to thank my member from Quitnam for his question and concerns regarding youth suicide in his community. My question is to the Minister of Education. Community members in Peel are worried that this government just doesn't understand what's necessary to address anti-black racism in our schools. They have criticized the minister for not hiring black reviewers because they know you need to have people with the expertise and lived experience at the table. Now we're hearing that the two people hired to do outreach for the review are not black either. According to the Toronto Star, Community leaders and experts in anti-black racism are, quote, aghast at the reviewing team's wholly inadequate outreach efforts, unquote. My question to the minister is, can he explain why he thinks it's unnecessary to have black staff conduct the much-needed outreach into black communities for this review of anti-black racism? Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions addressed to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, I reached out to each of the members opposite from Peel Region as well as members of our government in the days leading up to my decision to appoint reviewers. We moved very quickly, perhaps one of the quickest uh, decision points made in the context of sending in reviewers to a board that had made some requests, both complaints from parents and families. Any form of discrimination and prejudice is unacceptable in our schools. It's why we moved quickly, Mr. Speaker. But in addition, Patrick Case. The Assistant Deputy Minister for Supporting Student Potential, uh, the, the Secretary of my ministry, is the lead of this review. And now, Mr. Case Pack is not only a leader within the Black community, a human rights lawyer, a person of impeccable integrity, but someone who is involved in every single review. And this individual brings his own lived experience as someone who fights strongly for equity and equality within our schools. And we have confidence in him Bonds. to lead the process to ensure we actually come forth with recommendations that can change the culture within the schools of Peel. Well <laughs> Supplementary question, the member for Toronto St. Paul. Speaker, may I just say that Patrick Case is a phenomenal leader. He is a community leader in the black community, but he is not an independent reviewer. You're not listening to the community. In order for a review of anti-black racism in our schools to have any credibility, and the question goes to the Minister of Education, the minister needs to get the fundamentals right. Black reviewers need to be at the table. Black community outreach staff need to be in place to connect 
with said black community. And the review needs to be accessible to students and parents who have experienced anti-black racism. They need to know where to sign up. Black community members shouldn't be confused about where to sign up, Speaker. All communication must be transparent. It is currently opaque especially with these rushed timelines. Speaker, how are we supposed to trust that the Minister of Education's review will accurately reflect what black students, parents and staff have been Question. experiencing at the Peel District School Board when he cannot get these basic fundamental components right? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you too, to the member opposite for the question. And Mr. Speaker, obviously it is the aim of the government to ensure inclusivity and respect of every student in, the, in Ontario. In Peel Region, when the allegations from students and parents, administrators, the chair and vice chair, among others, and trustees emerged to my desk, we took immediate action to call in reviewers. One of the reviewers is involved in the York Region District School Board on another issue of anti-black racism. But the point is, Speaker, I have asked. The, my assistant deputy minister, Mr. Patrick Case, who will be a reviewer, will be present in those meetings, in every single one of them without exception, to ensure that there is lived experience at the table and to ensure that he, who is leading this process in conjunction with the other two reviewers, delivers results and recommendations that fundamentally transforms the culture of governance and decision-making in Peel so that we ensure that there's no child that feels so isolated and discriminated against again. Response? Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you. My question this morning is to the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Mr. Speaker, we're all looking forward to what our government's next steps will be to address the long-standing gaps that have prevented so many Ontarians from receiving the necessary services and supports they require to overcome their mental health and addiction challenges. I know that the Minister is working every day alongside the Deputy Premier and the Minister of Health so that Ontarians can be fully supported on their journey towards mental wellness. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please provide an update to the members of this legislature on what Ontarians can expect to see when our mental health and addiction strategy has been established? Questions to the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Thornhill for that excellent question. Mr. Speaker, as the member stated, our government is working tirelessly to ensure that we create a connected and integrated mental health and addiction system that works for all Ontarians, no matter where in the province they reside. Whether someone is living in remote communities in Northern Ontario or one of the Indigenous communities or one of our brave first responders, we will ensure that all Ontarians will be able to get the help they require when and where they need it. Our strategy, Mr. Speaker, will ensure that Ontarians across the entire lifespan will be able to find the help they need for their unique challenges. We realize there is no one-size-fits-all solution to mental health and addictions in the province, and that's why we're working collaboratively across government to ensure Response. that we get this right. And I look forward to continuing working alongside my colleagues from partner ministries to ensure that nobody in Ontario is left behind. Supplementary question. I want to thank the minister for his response. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to see that our government is making mental health and addictions a priority. We all share the responsibility to ensure that Ontarians receive the services and supports they require to overcome their mental health and addictions challenges. Previous governments failed to address the numerous gaps in our mental health and addiction system, so it's reassuring to hear that we are creating a strategy that will allow people across the province, no matter where they live, to locate and receive the services and supports for their unique mental health and addictions needs. Mr. Speaker, we must all work together to create a connected and integrated mental health and addiction system. Could the minister please inform the members of this legislature what our government's next steps will be to address mental health and addictions in Ontario? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank uh, the member again for that important question. First and foremost, Mr. Speaker, I cannot stress enough the importance of Bill 116. Bill 116, if passed, would see the creation of a dedicated mental health and addiction centre for excellence. If passed, Bill 116 would also enable the implementation of our mental health and addiction strategy. 
Bill 116 also proposes to give us the tools we require to hold opioid manufacturers and wholesalers accountable for their role in the ongoing opioid crisis. It would also help us recover health care costs paid by the province due to opioid-related disease, injury or illness. Mr. Speaker, should Bill 116 pass, our government intends to invest any award from litigation against the manufacturers and wholesalers of opioids Response. directly into frontline mental health and addiction services. Mr. Speaker, for too long, previous governments failed to take meaningful action to address mental health and addictions in Ontario, and we're committed to doing something about it. Thank you very much. The next question, the member from Nickelback. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier. On January 1, first, this government's cuts to public health will come into effect. Despite the Premier hiring an advisor with a six-figure salary to hold consultation on the future of public health in Ontario, can the Premier tell us why the government is still going ahead with cuts to public health even as they hold consultation on the future of public health? Question. Is uh, going to be responded to by the Minister well, of Health. I thank the member very much for the question. And in fact, we are undertaking a full consultation on both public health and emergency medicine with Mr. Jim Pine, who is actually traveling to communities across Ontario to understand what their needs are, recognizing that there are different geographic needs, different parts of the province, of course. And we have spoken with a number of public health units. They are very um, pleased with the way things are moving forward, and they understand particularly in the case of the Ottawa Public Health Officer, that they're able to make those changes that we have suggested without any impact on frontline care, that no patient will uh, be not receiving assistance. They will still be able to do their work in public health and will be able to do so under the, the uh, different circumstances coming forward next year. Supplementary question. When will this government learn that the cut first consult later approach, it's not working. Yes. It didn't work in long-term care, didn't work in education, it didn't work for children with autism, and it is not working for public health and the municipalities that are trying to deliver these critical services. In fact, because of the Conservatives' government cuts to public health, municipalities are now facing really tough decisions. Last week, chatham Ken Municipal Council said that the Premier's cuts to public health and other municipal services will cost them $2.3 million, forcing them to consider raising property taxes. And yesterday, Barrie's City Council yeah. approved an increased property taxes because of the provincial cuts. Why is the minister downloading, the premier downloading their irresponsible public health cuts to municipalities? Minister Health. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think it's really important to note that there are no cuts to public health. We are modernizing our public health services, which has been recommended for several years by the Auditor General of Ontario, who has recognized that there's often an overlap in services, there's not great coordination of services among public health units, and that there are situations where it's very difficult to find a public health officer. So what we're doing is modernizing the system with the assistance of Mr. Pine. Um, Ottawa Public Health, as you've raised an example, Ottawa Public Health was able to find efficiencies in next year's budget by eliminating vacant positions and reducing advertising expenses and internal administration. What we need to focus on are what are the particular issues in public health in each geographic area of Ontario. That is what we're focusing on. We recognize that the provincial government also has a role to play. That is why we've brought forward the dental program for low-income seniors, a $90 million a year program that's going to benefit low-income seniors across the province. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, recently our Premier signed a memorandum of understanding with Premier Higgs and Premier Mo to work together on developing small modular reactors technology right here in this province. Mr. Speaker, we have the environmental and economic benefits that developing nuclear technology brings to Ontario. In addition, Mr. Speaker, the nuclear power industry is responsible for creating 60,000 direct and indirect jobs in this province. 
Thousands of these jobs are in full-time positions in, in the Oakville corridor. Will the minister please tell us why it is so important that we will continue to support the nuclear power industry in Ontario? Questions to the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mining. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the All-Star member from Oakville, who's absolutely right. His uh, constituency is the epicenter of small modular reactor technology. Mr. Speaker, the opportunities are limitless. The on-grid power generation potential market value exceeds $100, million, uh, $100 billion a year, Mr. Speaker, and importantly, would replace um, uh, fossil fuel plants in our system here in Ontario. Off-grid, more than $30 billion of potential market uh, value, Mr. Speaker, with applications across northern communities and isolated and remote uh, mining and forestry opportunities. And then, of course, there's the export potential, and this is the key, Mr. Speaker, as Ontario has chosen under this Premier, Mr. Speaker, to lead s uh, small modular reactor technology by moving ahead, Mr. Speaker, with this uh, uh, the memorandum of understanding with our, our provincial partners, Mr. Speaker, we're certain we have the potential to exceed more than $150 billion in export uh, market potential, Mr. Speaker, with made in Ontario small modular. Much supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplementary question is to the Associate Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, it is apparent that nuclear energy is an important part of Ontario's economy and energy supply mix. Investing in small modular reactor technology is a critical next step to becoming an international leader in non-emitting power for off-grid communities. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, SMRs are a promising potential source of safe and reliable power for our entire country and will help us achieve Canada's climate targets. Will the minister please tell us more about the potential of SMRs and the multitude of ways in which they can be used. Minister of Energy. Associate Minister of Energy. Referred to the Associate Minister of Energy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the honourable and hardworking member from Oakville for his question and happy to shed some light on just how important the nuclear industry is for the people of Ontario. The nuclear industry has become a strategic asset for Canada at home and on the international stage. In my area alone, Bruce Power's eight units provide over 4,000 full-time, high-paying jobs to highly skilled wow. women and men. The important work that these hardworking Ontarians do day in and day out adds billions of dollars into Ontario's economy annually. Mr. Speaker, all the while Bruce Power produces safe and reliable energy for our province that produces zero carbon emissions and life-saving isotopes, and now there is the opportunity for small modular reactors. Mr. Speaker, this is why our government continues right. to stand up for our nuclear industry as they continue to innovate and lead on the world stage. Here, here, here. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, there's big news in Durham Region. Highway 418 is finished, and folks will be able to connect from the 401 to the 407 and 115. It will, like the 412, be a toll road. Back in the day when PC candidates were campaigning in the election, they promised to make taking the tolls off of the 412 and 418 their first order of business if elected. Well, Speaker, spoiler alert, they became the government, and the tolls are still there. Will the Premier commit, as the Durham candidates did on the campaign trail when they needed the votes, to removing the tolls from the 412 and the 418? The Deputy Premier. The Minister of Transportation. Referred to the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, as the member opposite knows, our government campaigned on a promise to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario and for the people of Durham Region. The MPPs from the Durham Region, as we call them in our caucus, Mr. Speaker, the Durham Four, includes the President of the Treasury Board, the Minister of Finance, the Chief Gov Government Whip, and the member for Durham, have been advocating very much, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we are taking steps to make sure that residents of Durham have, uh, have the uh, opportunity to be heard on the issue of tolls. That is why our government is undertaking a study to assess the economic impact of tolls in the region of Durham and on motorist behaviour in the area. Mr. Speaker, we look forward to receiving the outcome of this study, and it will inform our next steps on this matter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Premier. Since the election, students, commuters, boards of trade, community groups, chambers of commerce, municipalities, and I have all made the case for the removal of tolls from the 412 and 418. And now the government wants us to applaud a shiny new study to see if there's a case for the removal of the tolls from the 412 and the 418. 
I don't think this government has any intention of removing the tolls or doing right by the folks in Durham. I think this is about kicking the can down that wide open, underutilized road, once again backpedaling on commitments made to the folks across Durham Region. When I got elected, I tabled Bill 43 to do what I promised, to remove the tolls from the 412 and 418. Now the 418 is opened, and just as the Liberals promised and just as the Liberals planned, it will unfairly cost the folks of Durham. Durham Region deserves transportation and transit that will keep up with our growth and potential. So will you commit to removing the tolls from the 412 and the 418, yes or no? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, once again, once again, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the, the members uh, from the Durham region are excellent advocates for their constituents on this issue as well as others, and I want the people of Durham to know Order. that I am listening to the MPPs from the Durham region. Toll increases, Order. Mr. Speaker, were cemented into the Liberal plan to build these highways. And they I, I apologize to the Minister of Transportation for interrupting. The House must come to order so I can hear the Minister of Transportation respond to the question. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Toll increases were cemented into the Liberal plan to build these highways, Mr. Speaker, and they were part of their plan to toll them for the next 25 years. We are looking into options moving forward, and I have directed the ministry to undertake a study on the economic impacts of these tolls. The people of Durham have our word, Mr. Speaker, that we are listening and that we could not ask for better advocates than the Durham Four. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Consumer spending drives Ontario's economy, accounting for approximately 55 to 60 percent of GDP annually. The people of Ontario need stronger protections when they spend their hard-earned money, whether they're making day-to-day -day purchases or making investments in their futures. The economy has changed, and so have consumer spending practices. It's quite clear that Ontario's consumer protection framework needs significant change to keep up with how the people of this province buy goods and services. Speaker, can the minister explain to this House what our government is doing to strengthen protection and promote trust and confidence for the people of Ontario? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you to the member from Eglinton Lawrence for your excellent question. Because our government recognizes Ontario's consumer protection framework has not kept pace with the way people make purchases or how businesses work today, including the shift to on the online market. That is why we're proposing changes to improve and update consumer services and protections across this province through the Rebuilding Consumer Confidence Act. Our legislation proposes a wholesale review of the Consumer Protection Act. We need to make sure that every element of the legislation works for consumers and businesses throughout Ontario. Our government is also embarking on an extensive round of consultations that will focus on increasing consumer protection for every person across this province because we need to be looking closely at our legislation to make sure it reflects the realities of today. Thank you. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for her answer. The way that people make purchases and how businesses operate has changed, especially with the rise of e-commerce over the years. Yep. Consumer protection allows individuals to have the trust they need to make knowledgeable and informed decisions. Ontarians should be able to rely on legal protections. Consumer protection laws need to be updated so they remain fair and provide consumers the protection and confidence they need. Can the minister elaborate further on the proposed changes in the Rebuilding Confidence Act and explain more about the role consultation will play in the review of consumer protection legislation? Minister. And I'd be pleased to speak to the consultations, and thank you to the member from Eglinton Lawrence for, again, that important question, because it's important that Ontarians know that we're looking at this very seriously. Our government will be conducting a thorough review of the Consumer Protection Act for the first time in 15 years. This review is being centred around holding consultations with stakeholders and consumers. 
These consultations will enable us to continue to implement stronger protections for the people of this province. The legislation covers a wide variety of protections for consumers, protections for those who travel, use elevators, credit cards, or buy tickets to their favourite games or concerts. We want to hear from everyone in early 2020 to help shape Ontario's new consumer protection framework. Our government is focused on updating the regulations so that it is clear to businesses what practices are unacceptable Response. and so there are clear deference for bad actors who try to take advantage of consumers in this province. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Every week, I hear from desperate tenants whose landlords are trying to raise their rent more than the legal limit. Tenants like Le uh, Leonard. Leonard is 72. He lives at 103 Avenue Road. Leonard lives on $1,600 a month from his pension, and $1,500 of that goes to rent. He has $100 left. For food, Leonard lives on protein shakes and one small meal a day. Now his corporate landlord wants to increase his rent by 9 per cent, well above the legal limit. Leonard is terrified that if his increase is approved, he will be homeless. How can the Premier stand by and let seniors like Leonard fall into homelessness? Questions addressed to the Premier. The Minister of Municipal Affairs. Referred to the Minister of Municipal Thanks, Affairs. Uh, thanks, I want to thank the Honourable Member for uh, for putting the question uh, on the floor this morning. Uh, obviously, if the, uh, if the matter is before the uh, Landlord-Tenant Board, I'm not going to speak to the specifics of the case, uh, but, I, but I have listened to uh, a lot of concerns by both uh, landlords uh, and tenants in the province. That was part of our Housing Supply Action Plan. We took very seriously uh, the 2,000 submissions we received across the province on the five themes of the Housing Supply Action Plan, which included the rent piece, uh, speaker, we are very carefully reviewing uh, what we've heard from both landlords and tenants. I've been in constant contact with the Attorney General about resources uh, required for the Landlord-Tenant Board. Uh, we're going to have more to say uh, in the coming year as we move forward on the, the next phase of our Housing Supply Action Plan. But we take Response. these concerns very seriously. Again, uh, if the member wants to pass along those individual concerns to me, uh, they're always welcome. Thank you very much. That concludes question period for this morning. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.